Hello. 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 Some people coming. Hello. 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 Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. Hi. Dobre, welcome, and whatever feel comfortable with. Greetings. Again, Hi. from Portugal. Hi. Great. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, some of you maybe saw us already on Friday if you took part yes. in, in the training on out of the box RPG online. Today, uh, here, welcome to the to the other training on RPG online, but this time for more advanced players after the fall. My name is Hanya Tuska. I'm a game changer team member together with uh, Francesco Perconti. Manager of the project. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Yeah, he has this sunny um, background there. Me and okay. together with <laughs> together with Aaron Mitak, also team member. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and of course, our star of today, Marcin Zhitkowski. Please say something. So I can see you. Hello there, everyone. Nice to see you all. Mm. <laughs> 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 Good. <laughs> Martin is the uh, game designer and he used to be a sociotherapist mm. also. Mm. He was... Mm. Please, please mute, mm. mute your microphone so you <laughs> are not <laughs> trying to speak to us. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do this on my own. Uh, so uh, I was just telling you that Martin is a, a designer of this game, which he will be teaching you about, uh, and also has uh, many experience in not only game design, but also sociotherapy and working with groups, especially with youngsters. So he would be of great help for you. But today's meeting is dedicated to facilitators and organizers of the game, not game masters themselves. So it's step one in our adventure. But before we start, I would like to maybe give you a little, little um, space on this floor. And I would just like to ask you to come out and say hi, if you are from uh, CPI organization from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Are you here? Hi. Yes, there are two of us. Greetings. <laughs> Great. Hi. Nice to see you here. And from Bulgaria, open space, Peppa and her friends. Are you here? Not yet. Not yet, maybe. Okay. And uh, welcome, Georgia, Media Center Kaheti, Levani and his partners. Are you here with us today? Yeah, hi. Hi. <laughs> it's hi. just me. Glad to see you. Some of the background. <laughs> yeah. Italy, Librazione. Are you with us? Yeah, we are here. Yeah. Hello. The only organization from Latvia. Uh, please come and tell me how to pronounce your name. <laughs> uh, you, you just say PG. PG. Okay. Yeah, it, it works perfectly. <laughs> welcome, welcome, PG. Thank you. Okay. And Lithuania, Kiev organization. Are you with us? Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, Logos from Poland. Hi. Hello. From Ukraine. <laughs> hey, yes, right Very nice. Great to see your faces. Portugal, Elemento. Are you with us? Yo. <laughs> Great. Serbia, Cetra, Predrag, and friends. Hello. Very good. Slovenia, Drustvo Otra. Am I pronouncing it right? Okay. Hungary, parallel words. I like hey. Hey, nice to meet you. And again, Italy, Patatrak. Am I right? To... Yes, <laughs> that's right. And I am here, but also one of my team, he's in the waiting room. So when, when it's possible, can you add the other one? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> of course. And just a second. And the last one from Germany, Belgium, Mar de Colores. 
are you with us? Not yet. Maybe in this waiting room. Okay, I'm admitting. Yeah, I already have two people in the waiting room also. This is a lesson. <laughs> oh. Hello, uh, Elena. Okay, so what you can expect today is uh, quite long. Let's not pretend it's not long because the game is really complex. Um, so quite long presentation by Martin. And then we will have a little break, like, you know, two minutes break for catching a breath, catching, going for toilet and so on. Uh, and we will be back with questions and answers session. And in the end, uh, there will be a little of organization uh, information from my side and probably Aaron's also. Okay, so I give the floor to, ah, before. Um, how we proceed is that Martin has a lot to tell you. This meeting is recorded. Remember, you will be able to have access to our meeting and you can see through again. You will have access to the presentation also and to all the materials which Martin is talking about from yesterday on. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, like Martin will be giving the breaks and asking, hey, 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 um, do you have any questions? So uh, please wait for this moment, unless you are totally lost and you have very specific questions to this concrete slide, then please put it on chat and I will be the person who is catching these questions and interrupting Martin, okay? Thank you so much and I'm giving floor to you. Okay, so I am uh, very happy uh, to be able to show you this brainchild of mine. Uh, some of you, I believe, uh, might have already witness the world after the fall. Uh, what was uh, uh, already said is that uh, this particular meeting is for the people that will be organizing the games. So I will by necessity omit many technical details, um, uh, particularly about the rules and in-depth lore, uh, because those are rather reserved for game masters. Uh, because I wouldn't be able to condense it into uh, this webinar. Uh, we could stay here even several days if you wish, and I can tell you all the nooks and crannies about the game, but uh, I don't believe we possess enough time in our week. So I will start off with the presentation. Oh, here, you, here we go. Do you see it correctly? Everything is fine? Great. So, yes. after the fall online RPG, so now organization training. Uh, what uh, will be our today's agenda? First, uh, I want to focus a little bit on what actually a social RPG is and uh, what makes it a little different for, from many activities uh, that uh, could be done online, what makes it different uh, from, for example, out of the box, what is the niche of this particular game. Then we'll go to the structure of the game and what it is about, uh, what are your um, activities, what will you be doing in this game. Then there will be more or less somewhere around there a break then preparations for the game and the briefing uh, upon which I wish to spend a little more time because this is important. This is uh, the moment uh, when actually you can like instigate change in your participants. So uh, think about our design documents. I will be sometimes referring to the design document, which I have right here. It looks like this. You should be all seeing it right now and you all should have uh, access to it earlier. And uh, we will be uh, viewing certain uh, areas of this uh, document. 
uh, because uh, as it is already written down, uh, there is no need to put it twice into the presentation. And also, uh, while I'll be talking about it, you will know exactly where in the document you should sh uh, seek the answers that you might need. Uh, I hope that's clear. So now, uh, get uh, we're getting back to the training. And we go into the structure of the game. But in this aspect, uh, this game, most of all, is something taking drawing from both worlds because it relies on the familiarity of board games. It has many elements of the board game. You do have a board uh, upon which you place tokens. You move around the board and on, those, on the board are indicators telling you what is actually happen happening but uh, much in the style uh, of a uh, few board games with more narrative experience. Uh, for example, uh, Dead Winter is such a, uh, such a um, board game that has more fluff to it, uh, more lore uh, to the situations. Here, every action on the board is described uh, by the game master. There are no cards indicating what's going on because in board games, most of the time a person can just pick up a card and read out, out loud to everyone uh, what's going on. Here the game master takes control uh, over this situation. And moreover, it's very important to state it right here that game master can and should improvise elements uh, based on what he sees uh, his participants uh, actually want and need for their experience. So uh, this uh, mm, is meant to create an involvement uh, among your participants, like long-term involvement among young people uh, uh, in an ongoing projects. Why it is important, uh, not the long time involvement, of course, but why this particular uh, activity can allow you to make uh, an ongoing involvement. Because, of course, you can, and I will um, state it again with more details later on, uh, you can treat it as one off. So, uh, like most of the games, you just open the box, you set the uh, board, you play it, you finish it, you've closed the game and you go on. This game is more like a TV series. Uh, you can divide the entire gameplay into uh, several meetings with your youth and upon it uh, build regularity of your meetings uh, you will know more about them, they will more know about you. And this narrative is something, like in the TV series, narrative is important, can dr uh, draw them in more and more. Of course, uh, more on that later. Uh, are there any questions up until this point? Okay. So, uh, while talking about... Uh, the social RPG as a uh, as a tool. Uh, I will tell you what uh, is the facilitator role, what is the game master's role, uh, with which you may be concerned if you wish to be both. But I will be. Uh, here's a spoiler alert. Uh, I not not recommend trying to be both. It is preferable that there are two people actually. Uh, working on the same game with the same group of youths. So the facilitator, this concerns you. Your main objective is to provide uh, everybody, GM and participants, with uh, smooth technical experience. So you should create a group 
of your participants, know your participants, uh, so gathering info about, about participants, who are they, what is their background, uh, what, why are they in the project, why are they interacting you, with you at all. Then uh, with, uh, in conjunction, in, in, uh, in understanding with your uh, game master, you will decide upon the narrative path. I will go more uh, deeply into this later on, but uh, long story short, what, uh, what is the flavor of the story? What particular, in particular you wish to achieve uh, in the story? What subject you want to touch upon? Uh, because there are multiple ways you can play the same game. And uh, actually this game plays differently every single time. Now, uh, you are, of course, responsible for the communication. Uh, and also, you should uh, observe the game because you are responsible for the briefing. Why you? Because as you represent your organization and as you envisioned using the game as a tool in your social activities, uh, your social campaign, you as well should be the one uh, whom your participants uh, uh, con uh, consider uh, as a person to speak about these things. So it is assumed that you are, uh, facilitators are people that will be working with these youth uh, for the long term. And uh, also you are the most uh, uh, appropriate person to touch upon the subjects of uh, social change that you wish to uh, achieve through the game. And observing the game is necessary because you need to know what happened and uh, point actual moments in the game that are crucial. And uh, Recruiting a game master, that's quite obvious. Uh, sometimes it's uh, harder, sometimes it's easier. I will tell you more uh, about what you should be looking for in your game master. Now, are there any questions at this point? Great. Game master, on the other hand, uh, as you are the hardware, of this experience, he is the software of this experience. He's the one that will conduct the narrative. But as I said, there is no one holy canon fixed narrative. Uh, there are multiple uh, events uh, taking place in the world of the game at the moment of the game and the decisions of participants influence which will be pronounced uh, and which will be completely omitted. Also in this uh, area of the game, in the lore of the game, many things happened and it is up to the game master to decide which uh, narrative beats he will be using, which points he will be touching upon. He's very uh, uh, important uh, aspect is immersing the players because if a narrator is uh, unable to draw them in then actually it defeats the point so this should be a person possessing uh, narrative skills and charisma to hook participants into the world deciding on a narrative path this is something that a game master does with facilitator I've spoken about it previously uh, deciding uh, in the game, uh, the end game crisis. So a game master decides what is the moment, I will speak about this more later on, but what is the moment when the game goes into the final third act where all the tensions will be resolved in the last showdown. Then a game master, of course, has to understand the source material and be able to convey the message of the game. Questions? Okay. So, I wouldn't recommend uh, for you to try to be uh, everything at once because every 
uh, game can have multitude of technical issues that can be detrimental to the experience. Uh, and even if you are playing with very tech savvy participants, it's always better if there is a person aside from the game master who will be uh, overloaded with work during the game, uh, it's be best that there is a person that they can reference to. And also, uh, it is good to have on your part as facilitators an overview of the entire situation. Uh, as for the elements, whoops, uh, that are necessary to be looked uh, in a game master. It is a fluent thing, but that's why we are doing this uh, particular uh, meeting here, this particular training. I will be showing you elements of the game and in, during each of these elements, I will be making exclaimers. So if you want a game master, bear in mind that this person must understand this. Okay, so pay attention because I will be pointing these things out. And also I will be pointing out uh, the things that you should be looking for while observing the game as a facilitator. We will be trying to do this both at the same time uh, uh, while discussing uh, every other uh, step of the game. Okay? Great. Uh, so... Um, Sorry, I must just uh, interrupt you. Yes. There are, there are questions like, Balint is saying, facilitator deciding on narrative path is a bit confusing. Could you elaborate on that? And I think I can just tell you that within the training, you will see the points where you as facilitator, you can decide how you go, how the narrative path should go. Okay? Yes. Please, please, please wait for this point. Yes. The other question is, can the game master be responsible for both the game and the debriefing? Martin? Uh, I, as a game master, very often do this. Mm. But uh, most of the time when I uh, conduct R RPGs, uh, I am doing the thing, the thing that I am, uh, uh, you, say, uh, you see, I told you before that I wouldn't recommend to be both. That's because I most of the time am both and it's a chore. It's no fun at all. So it is possible, but it's counterproductive. Uh, yeah, and, and as I am, um, yes? As you will see all uh, during this training, the game is so complex that there should be two people. One is behind the scenes and is organizing everything and equipment, IT and so on. This is Game Master. And here is the space for you to be a facilitator, to be ready to understand what exactly, what the meaning of the game should be there for your for your participants and that's that's the briefing part mainly like this is your main task uh, there is another question will there be a special training for the game master to go deeper into the game dynamics there will be a materials and like training materials for game masters let us discuss it in the end okay yes just now and also that's only on yeah. your role as facilitator we are on the, uh, on the slide uh, right now uh, at which I am touching upon this. There will be a video for Game Masters. Yeah. Uh, so there. Uh, mm -hmm. And I hope it will be helpful. Uh, there is also technical video for Game Masters, how to use online tools for the game, but that's a different subject. Uh, and let's yes. leave it now. So what will follow, we will say in the end of the for now, please like be a like, let's focus on facilitating now, okay? Thank you. All the questions were answered. Yes. Mm. Okay. So now we are in the structure proper. Uh, so the first stage, what is a social RPG is done. Now, uh, what 
Yes, somebody said something. Uh, that was a glitch. Anyways. Martin, just go on, please. Yes, 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 of course. Uh, this game, most of all, is about uh, working as a group to achieve goals. People work in those small units, but also have to coordinate actions of units, of their squads, more on that later, with a bigger picture. And it is uh, there, there's to decide what is the difficult goal. Uh, what you should be telling your participants, what they should know, is that this game is not easy. And that's why it's stated here that, that this goal is difficult. Uh, then you should be able to, in this game, overcome hardship and fear maybe, because in its inception, this game was a survival horror. And uh, of course, it's really hard to convey the survival horror message in a short version, like one off uh, version of the game. It is really easier to build this horror experience uh, while playing as a longer campaign with several meetings where we draw the um, narration uh, longer. Then uh, immersing in the devastation that is caused by radicalization. So it is really, really important to show people how uh, um, characters in, the, in that game basically kill themselves with their own fist. So uh, many elements of the narrative and many uh, aspects of the narrative path treat upon different aspects of radicalization. So there. And uh, learning about, uh, more about the difficult, uh, difficulty of actually seeing the bigger picture. Uh, because we as a species has a tendency for a tunnel vision uh, either on uh, names, uh, labels, resources, uh, points. There are many things on which we tend to focus with exclusion of everything else. And this game shows what, uh, uh, what is the, the effect of our tunnel vision. Any questions as for this element? No, I, believe we, sh I believe we should go forward, you know? Yes, 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 yes. Click. So the primary goal of this game is immersion. Uh, everything here is about evoking emotions, uh, particularly appre apprehension, uh, because we want to make our participants think about radical behavior uh, and their role uh, in uh, facilitating or stopping it. But immersion, uh, is the name of the game. It's the situation where a person leaves the physical plane of normal reality and goes deeply into the story. And in this particular story, people will be crafting the story together with the narrator. So unlike video games, uh, well, maybe video games are actually on the more immersive uh, side of things, but unlike TV or books, people will have... Uh, their own con contribution to the story. So we want a certain mood or a certain emotional state from our people, from our participants. We want to overcome the boundary between imagination and uh, per real personal involvement, because at the end of the day, it's no different. A person that is actually involved into something uh, can be involved into things which are real and which are not and I think you all have witnessed it. Uh, if you ever have a, had a hangover after reading a book or, a, or binging a series. Uh, so we want to involve them into this narrative state of mind. Uh, we want to encourage them to see past the limited view of a personal agenda. And of course, we want them to have some fun because believe it or not, some people and many people actually uh, love to be scared and love to be pressed against the wall 
where the challenge is real and everything is gritty. Uh, especially when I uh, encounter uh, young people, adolescents, uh, they uh, actually ask me to uh, hurt them using this game. So uh, make of it what you will. Uh, anyhow, let us carry on. Uh, well, wait, uh, questions? No, 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 let's go. So secondary goals. So every game achieves multiple goals. So this, uh, these things here are like, eh, it would be kind of fun. It's kind of nice to have these, but if not, no problem. That, that's, that those are secondary and it is, they are achievable using the game, but you should not focus too much on them. So communication skills, uh, so uh, tunnel vision, like, actually explaining to participants what it is, conveying some information uh, from the scientific side and uh, driving their attention uh, into the subject of climate change. Because the premise of the game was a climate change. Uh, it was uh, like, I, I, I've got a, an order for this to make it a climate change game. So there, there's a climate change. But those are secondary things and we should not tunnel vision upon them. Haha, <laughs> pun. And uh, no, that's actually not a pun. Uh, anyways, we're going to the narrative. So that's, this is the last uh, moment where you can uh, ask me about these things. And I see none questions, so let's carry on. What will be this game? What we will tell people that this game is about? Uh, now, I am going into the lore of the story. The lore will be especially important for your game masters. But you as a facilitator need to know the best general uh, premise uh, because you basically need to have an understanding, uh, like communication with your game master. How I would imagine it is that you and your game master sit and uh, talk to each other about the lore, which elements do you like, which you would like to emphasize, like have a real nice constructive discussion, uh, maybe a little bit immerse yourself into it so that you may together make a decision which story elements will be more or less pronounced. So we are in the apocalypse. Long story short, uh, we have messed up our world really, really badly. And this uh, piece of uh, turd fell into the uh, rotor in, in the supersonic speed. So everything is really, really messed up. And we begin in this uh, environment where as all the cities are uh, basically eviscerated and uh, lie in ruins or under the waves because the level of the sea is risen, those five words uh, for many people in the wastelands um, ring like salvation. So the European Pact for Combating the Climate Change. I will uh, give you a detailed uh, storyline, timeline of the events in, in here, but you just at this point need to know that this is a super high-tech organization that started as a non-profit organization uh, trying to solve the problems of the changing world. But in the end, uh, as they uh, developed into the areas of robotics and cybernetic enhancements of reality, they became the dominant political and economical force in the European Union. And their technologies pushed the boundaries of what we consider uh, as technology, blurring the, the, the border between technology and magic. They are very unrecognizable uh, to us. And yes, uh, Question, question, no. And that European Pact for Combating Climate Change, I like to call them epic. And this is a part of lore actually that people do not call it 
uh, EPCCC because it's a mouthful. They just call it EPIC or EP3 or something like that, but EPIC is how I call them. So EPIC created a lot of facilities. Facilities were uh, deep storage bunkers uh, meant to preserve the most uh, important elements of the technology, knowledge, science from the devastation. And here we are uh, in the facility, which was the, the greatest of them all, the most important of them all. Uh, those facilities were um, all filled with high tech, but they all had something uh, that was the ghost in the machine, the AI that was governing uh, the entirety, everything inside. Basically, the buildings were alive. But our uh, participants don't know it yet. So, ghosts and ghouls uh, and that database. Why do people go inside those facilities? They go inside to retrieve artifacts that can change their life, that can save their life. The universal assemblers that allow them to create medicine or weapons or tools, uh, databases to gain knowledge, information, uh, I call those the database. Ghosts are the cybernetic occurrences, electromagnetic occurrences within those uh, facilities. And ghouls, where we will speak more about the ghouls, but actually there is an entire mythos of anomalies, uh, paranormal activity going on inside the bunkers. It's not paranormal per se, but from the perspective of people that do not understand the workings of the technology behind it, it is it may as well be paranormal. Now, our protagonists, people that you, maybe you, maybe your participants, will be playing as the Elysium. Uh, I am really, really fond of this graphic here. Uh, Elysium... Imagine a town that was near a base, a military base. And this town, uh, when things started to get serious, instantly created a bond with military personnel. And they worked together to uh, create a fortified emplacement where they warn off the worst of the attacks. Some of them died. Some some people were lost, some things were lost, but then survivors start coming from the wasteland and hence the Elysium was created. Uh, they try to retrieve and preserve uh, technological marvels as they themselves possess a fair share of them due to the fact that military equipment uh, was on rather high end of the spectrum. So even though large uh, areas have basically degraded into a primitive, like pre-industrial way of life, here we still have uh, cherished and prized relics of the past and Elysium uh, sends their forces to retrieve more, to secure more. And here are Ariadna troops. These are characters of your participants. Ariadna troops are basically cyborgs. They are capable of uh, interacting with uh, advanced technology due to the fact that they all have neural stack uh, buried deep within their skulls and hence they can activate things uh, using their wills they can speak to each other uh, telepathically. I mean, they do not have to move their mouths to send messages, images. They can stream their uh, battle expertise to another participant and so on. But on the flip side, if there is some uh, malicious uh, software like uh, a virus, uh, they, it can attack them like it was an influence of some malicious power. So there we have that uh, 
that survival horror they may see for example a hologram that they will be afraid of and this will be a virus and it will actually hurt them that, that that's a very uh, important beat in the story but it of course can be omitted because that's why you choose the narrative pass and here what you can see are the uh, squads uh, basically the names of the squad so we have uh, gamma sigma theta and epsilon these are our boys and girls uh, it's really hard to tell underneath those uh, suits which are on the uh, high-tech side of things okay so that was the breakdown of the lore are there any questions for this subject right now because I see the chat was active for a while. Awesome, Marcin. Thank you. Oh, okay. Cool. Uh, anyhow, this element is something very important for you as a facilitator because this is uh, the, this, the, the informations that your uh, participants will receive from you and you must prepare them um, for the game and convey uh, the, the, those informations, the feeling, the situation before they even begin. It's, it shouldn't be done at the moment where they uh, don't really know why are they here, what will they will be doing, what is the lore, what, what's going on, and they just are expected to understand everything in a flash. It, it must, there must be a build-up to it, but you should have your uh, faithful game master at your side, and it is here when you decide what you tell them and what they should and what they shouldn't know up front. You decide basically how uh, advanced uh, their knowledge of the world is. You can throw them in nearly blindfolded, but you can also give them an entire intel and treat them as their special forces. The decision which you take here will, uh, is, is dependent on how you wish your participants to feel. Do you want, how special you want them to feel? How uh, how much emphasis do you want to place on the coordination aspect and or the horror aspect? Because the more they know, the less they are afraid. The less they are afraid, the more effective they work, the, the more effective decisions they make. So it is actually very important to make a correct call here. So to go shortly over this. Uh, so there is this epic complex localized in the wastelands. Elysium assembles Ariadna squads to explore the ruins and regain the artifacts. Forward HQ is established. Several squads go missing. So there are people that went in there before our guys start the game. Uh, hostile entities, and uh, that's very important, entities. We don't know what they are. We don't have the information. They shouldn't have the information, what it is. Uh, are confirmed within the facility and resources are running low. So their expedition will be the final one. If they fail, you have to take shop and go home. And here we are in the element that I've been uh, talking previously, the narrative path. When you decide on the direction you wish to go with the game, uh, so this, 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 the setup of the game, the starting point of the game, uh, when you decide it, oh, okay, so the very important thing. This uh, here is the starting point. So it is very important for you to notice this. Every game, uh, every webinar will have this element of, of a starting point. And uh, these are like this parameters that must be conveyed to the participants and upfront. So back to the uh, narrative pass. Uh, you choose uh, 
how you go from the starting position by the actions um, that take place within the rooms, but mostly uh, to, uh, by choosing the correct videos that we have prepared for you. And here I will now show you the, uh, the, the video, one of them. It's not like I'm going to uh, take a long time with it, but okay. So we are on the watch together. This is one of the platforms we are using uh, during running this game. It is, the, the thing that is uh, very cool about it is that you can uh, invite people and when you uh, press play, everybody in the room will see the uh, movie. So here we have our poor guy Andrusov. Dyscyplina. A co najważniejsze sprawia... Uh, and for, I have some problems with the internet, I see. But we could hear so, it. So, sorry, we will skip this then because I see the uh, my, my internet is um, being uh, overloaded. Uh, but I will, uh, but you can see those films, they will be in the materials for you. There will be transcripts of the movies. Uh, and I will now be talking about uh, those movies, uh, those narrative paths more in detail. So first we have the most survival horror uh, path of all and the most, uh, how to say, manifest destiny element of the game because uh, Dr. Major Goran Rayner, as you can see, is a scientific and military leader of the expedition full of faith in humanity and hellbent on bringing a better tomorrow for our species. The story of Dr. Major Goran focuses on the aspect of indomitable spirit of humanity and overcoming the odds. It is best to be applied as a counterpoint to the desolation in the complex if you want to bond, bond participants. So you can go two folds with this. Either you use this to create the survival horror experience because this assumes that they do not know anything and Dr. Major Goran will be sending them more and more info while they are moving through the facility. So it is assumed that um, we focus on them uh, being this uh, brave uh, crack team that uh, wants to really save the people back home and Dr. Uh, Goran is trying to help them, or we can make this a glorious tale of humanity standing up on their feet uh, because those movies uh, both uh, facilitate this. So the same progression through the rooms will be changed in their uh, minds, in the minds of participants, through different narrative means. So second person, the, the uh, tattered face that you've seen a second before uh, on the movie is uh, Andrusov. And uh, Andrusov is a deranged mind of, once, uh, of a once great engineer trapped within an immortal artificial body full of grief and sorrow. The story of Andrusov focuses uh, on the aspect of a personal responsibility and usefulness of a civil unrest uh, and war in, uh, in general. It uh, shows the darkness dwelling inside humankind and firsthand account of radicalization. So this is a war story of a person that lost his mind. Uh, they will not know this up front, but the story of Andrusov is scribbled on the walls. He is writing uh, like a madman that he is on the uh, on many areas of the game, and they will be by viewing his uh, mad ramblings, they will piece out the story that actually happened moments before the fall and right at the fall. They will see the fall from his perspective. And this is mm, most impactful if you wish to show them how a person 
may or may not uh, want to be a part of a crisis, but when the crisis hits, uh, the person is like a little pebble tossed into a waterfall. No stopping it. It's just going with the flow and tumbling all, all around. And here, uh, this is the most grim of the stories. Uh, it touches upon uh, aspects of murder, uh, suicide and stuff. So thread lightly. I really recommend you to uh, go into the details. Uh, nothing is overt. I don't, there's no gore or something like that. I tried to be make it as moody as possible, not uh, over the top. But this is the most gritty of them all. And here uh, is the Vanessa story. Overseer of the complex. Her brilliant mind merged with the artificial, uh, in, with the central artificial intel intelligence of the building. Now she is a literal spirit of this place. The story of Vanessa focuses on a corporate manipulation of the human mind and, da and the dangers of drastic measures put in place uh, in times of crisis. Hers is the story of uh, safety versus freedom, freedom dilemma. So here is uh, why, uh, how much of our freedoms are we willing to give uh, to stop uh, the world from burning uh, and to make us safe. Uh, this story is uh, telling more about uh, actual crisis within the complex, not the entire world, but this uh, story tells uh, about what happened within this building that transformed a thriving uh, post-scientific community into this graveyard uh, of both ideas and literal corpses. So those are the narrative paths. And before we go to the generic humanoid utility locus, I want to ask you, do you have any questions? No, no questions whatsoever. How are we yeah. doing? Martin, the, the only questions that were had uh, are regarding roll 20, but of course you'll address that later on. So just be mindful of that. Okay. Whoop. And for your, uh, to your knowledge, if you see the chat, which is, you know, like mm -hmm. do it with uh, all the engagement, it's not about questions. It's our gamers who are gossiping on the side. Ah, excellent. So don't I worry think. about the chat. And if there will be questions, I will bring it to you. Okay. I, I am uh, anxious to read all about it. Uh, so the ghouls, I mean, no sane person would want their marvel of technology be called a ghoul. It's just a coincidence that these creatures that uh, are participants uh, and their squad will be squads will be meeting in those ruins, ruins were designated as general, uh, generic humanoid uh, utility locus. What are they? They are puppets. Okay, they can, have I, can I interrupt you? Because actually there is one comment that I even don't know what to ask. I'm a bit lost. There is a comment. So I maybe I would like to ask you, Marcin, just to sum up, because you showed us three narrations, which mm -hmm. are connected to three different persons. One mm -hmm. And three different sets of movies. Yeah. And can you just tell very briefly what, like, it's our decision what which one to choose? Yes, uh, okay. you decide as facilitator and your game master should also have saying in this decision because okay. the, so the you are choosing which, which type, which figure, which person, which narrative you are going to use because of three elements which you just said, yeah? Uh, yes, but also you can mix them and match them. You can go completely Dr. Goran's route or completely Andrusov, or completely Vanessa, but you can do a little bit of Dr. Goran with a sprinkle of Andrusov, or mostly okay. Vanessa, you understand. But, but mm -hmm. when you say that you can mix them, it means that you can take a decision on what you want to achieve with your yes. masters, 
and go to your game master and tell him I need this direction, right? So yes, this and means that you go to game master and you tell him or her what's your decision. Mm -hmm. Now you do something in practice, right? Okay. And that's why I'm explaining the lore right now for you to be able to understand the stories, those transcripts that are there. Okay. Uh, so let's move uh, on. Thank okay, you. so really one word, one, one uh, or two sentences about the ghouls. Imagine a robot. You can see those uh, bad boys here. But they are created to be a puppet for person's uh, commands. So uh, a person with a neural stack in their head could use them as the prolongation of their will. Ghouls had their basic consciousness uh, and basic art, uh, intelligence, but it was like on the level of three years old, things like that. They were never meant to store a full human consciousness, but they were capable of doing so. And when uh, things got rough, when everything was desperate inside the complex for reasons, several people, actually a lot of them, decided to save themselves and they have copied their brains, their minds into ghouls. But unfortunately, ghouls do not have the neural network to support their brains, meaning that people fleeing from death actually uh, lost themselves, trapped themselves in the perpetual hunger and coldness. Uh, and those are the entities that our participants will be meeting. They will perceive them as hostile most of the time. And one of the story arcs is that they realize that they are actually uh, suffering remnants of the world before the fall. That's that. That's why I wanted you to know this, because it's a kicker. So, things to consider uh, before we go. I have in, my, in our design document, this will be our first sneak peek into design document, I believe. This is it, I believe. Yes, so uh, here I have uh, in our design document uh, right uh, at the front, oh, upfront up notice. Uh, I don't know what happened with the numerations here, but there are three points uh, which I really need you to consider uh, before playing the game. I will not go too deeply into this right now, but overall, uh, and now we go back to the presentation. Uh, this game is meant to be played several times. So what you should consider is how do you want to use it? Either you wish to play it once, uh, and be done with it in the next group, or you wish to play it several times with the same group, but the different scenarios, or you wish to prolong the scenario to explore deeper elements of the story. Second thing, advanced rules. There are many um, aspects of the game and uh, they are noted as advanced rules in the uh, design document, which I was using to great effect with my teams when I was playing, but they are not necessary to the experience, uh, while still they may really complicate the game. So yours and your game master, more your, on the side of your game master, discretion is advised. Then notifications, I will be pointing things out uh, out there. And the, the difficulty which is here are the online tools. And these are Discord, Roll20, and Watch Together. Watch Together you have seen already. Now I will show you the uh, Roll20. 
Okay, so uh, brace yourselves. This is what, what you're seeing right now is uh, the entirety, give me this, hello? I, uh, oh, okay, there we go. This is the entirety of uh, the game. Here are the floors of the complex. As you can see, uh, they are uh, marked with colorful tokens. Uh, these tokens uh, are elaborated upon in a section of the design document, which is called uh, status. And uh, I will show it to you because now we're dipping our toes. Oh, maybe no, I will tell you more well when we will be in the rules section, but what I wanted to show you, uh, here are the areas of each teams. And as you can see, they have their tokens. This is an area for the game master. But what is important is you have, uh, as a game master, access to all the assets here, and the, uh, and players will only have access to uh, their uh, character sheet. This is the sheet of the uh, one of the teams. This is actually epsilon team, and they will have their ability abilities here uh, and information. And what they will also have are their objectives, which we will be speaking about later on. So they will be able to move things around the, uh, move tokens around the board, decide upon where things are. Uh, and it may be a situation, there may be a situation where a game master will have to uh, understand the situation that uh, one team is on this floor and the second team is trying to find something on this floor and the third team entirely different floor. So that's why I told you that one person should have an overview uh, what uh, participants are talking to each other, what are they deciding upon, how are they f doing, uh, and allow game master to focus completely on uh, coordinating this entire mess. So that's that. <clears throat> uh, wait, wrong slide, sorry. Great. Uh, so let's carry on. Starting point. I told you that those informations at the start are important, but this is precisely what uh, the starting point of the game is for the players, what they will know uh, that there is, that they may find within this, uh, within this game. Uh, they will know they must be conveyed information that they are squads that will try to take objectives. That's the premise. Secondary, that they will be the ones crafting the story. They really need to be told that it's not like they are there to just move pieces around. They may, but they are uh, invited to uh, think about it, uh, think about themselves as people creating the story, because their decisions, the routes that they will take through the uh, through the complex, and their narrative decisions within the complex will show the the end result of the story. Uh, they need to know that there are videos, and there are video collections, so to say. They should be aware that they might get a significant amount because what I have noticed from my players is that when I told them that there are three types of videos, they wanted to explore this, the, the one particular type and they focused on that story. They themselves tried to reach the uh, understanding of the story. And also they need to know that they uh, will be traveling through the zones, 
uh, and each zone will tell a part of the story. So there will be narrative events. Okay. Let me, I let me interrupt you. Yes. A question. Will there be a preset Discord channel or do we need to set up one? And I believe that you already addressed it, that this is a role of a game master, right? Yes. But also the information from our site organizers is that, uh, Aaron, thank you for putting it there. Uh, they will need to be created by you, the preset Discord channels, uh, the Discord channels, but uh, we will provide a video training on this for those who want or need it, okay? Yes, and then just to add on top of what Hanya and Martin had said is all of these platforms are free, so we're not expecting, uh, this isn't a hidden cost. There are paid options for everything that we're using, but uh, from Marcin and Marta for both uh, online games that we have, you shouldn't need to pay. Uh, the free version will suffice for, for what you're using it for or what we will we'll be using it for. And in case you haven't watched uh, the materials which I sent to you in the email before this training, be ready for, uh, please watch it and then check if you are already uh, capable of working on your own. If not, then we will have to support you. Go, Martin. Okay, so because now uh, the things I will be talking about will have the elements of organizing the game, actually, uh, and I have called you here for about an hour already, so uh, there's a limit to your uh, consciousness and awareness. I propose to have a short break right now. We're okay, roughly five minutes. Gonna... Yes, five minutes. So, let... so we will see in so five. Yeah. We will meet back at 4.15. Yes, 4 15. That's, uh, that's six minutes, but uh, that's an easy time for everybody to remember. Okay, see you. And Bruno, what are you doing in, uh, in Portugal? What is doing uh, Elemento? Uh, Elemento is doing um, games for schools, uh, games for uh, old people, and we believe that games can really change the world. Uh, that's that's why we we pick up all these people that are here today, and we we have a lot of, a lot more that uh, wanted to come to this uh, to this training, and um, and we are already uh, working with municipalities and and some big organizations. So we are trying, we are uh, fairly new, but we are trying to move faster because uh, with COVID, uh, it, the games are the main uh, tool. You are here. Completely. Yeah. So we believe that's, that, that, that is the correct thing to do now. But I'm a gamification designer. Okay. Oh. Guys, the break is over. I hope hey. you oh. sent coffees. And gossips, please go to the chat to gossip. And please, Martin. Go on. Okay. So after this uh, introduction, now we get to what this how this game is structured, and this is the part where I will be pointing out the elements you should look for in your game master, and you should look for during the game with your players. So general structure is that we will have the brief uh, like briefing and workshops. More on that later. Three act structures, like in the regular story, we have the opening, the middle of the story, like first the exposition, then action, and then grand finale. Uh, and the element very important is the end game crisis, crisis. And then there will be the briefing where the magic happens. Briefing is. I would like to say on you, because uh, definitely uh, going over the starter pack with your participants while you are briefing to make them understand the rules, to make them understand everything, it is something um, that is your responsibility. And I will give you an idea how I envision doing it and how I did it several times. <clears throat> And possibly, like the workshop, this part is rather on the Game Master. You should look for a person that has ideas how to 
flash uh, in uh, on the flash improvise an exercise for your participants to make them role play a little bit why haven't i provide you like the strict rules how to do it mostly because every group is different different experiences different starting point i made this uh, uh, with people that never played rpgs before and the different exercises were needed and I did it with uh, participants that were all about RPGs and we've been playing together many times and they just like went straight in and this game definitely changed its shape. So in the briefing section, look for a person that can actually coordinate this, make them hype, make them engaged in this very first experience, this very first exercise. Second, as the game is uh, divided into three acts and the game itself has 10 rounds maximum, but it is not like you need to play all 10 rounds. Uh, sometimes you end after seven, sometimes you end after fifth, uh, sometimes you go all the way to the 10th. The, the amount of rounds are just ideas uh, how to organize your time is just your reference point uh, because you can it is generally good to think about every round as 20 minutes but there were rounds where uh, we spent 40 minutes because people were actually role-playing uh, um, talks between themselves and situations within their team and you as a overseer as a facilitator you need to look what's actually going on so if you see that your participants is having a, are having a blast role playing their characters give them a little more time because this is what this game is about they should be role playing and then uh, tell it to your game master for him not to push the uh, tempo but on the other hand if you see that everything is going apart because uh, people are uh, in Polish, there's this uh, uh, phrase in RPG community, zagrywać się jak świnie, which is roughly translated to overplay yourself like a pig. Uh, we say it, uh, we say that somebody is like, the pigs are ferocious. Yes, they, they, they're very always hungry. So if a person is hungry for the role playing experience, they lose track of time and space while playing. So you need to be also aware to control this uh, and um, because the game needs to have uh, those three acts. Even if you decided to prolong the story, to divide the story into several meetings, each meeting should com be composed of three acts uh, for the effects purpose. Uh, so as it is stated here, First, we should need to show them the setting, then setting the stakes, then re resolve the tensions. Now, the briefing uh, as a part will be more on that later, but the briefing is on you. So things that you gather watching participants throughout every uh, act, you will use in the debriefing. You should, as a facilitator, be able to point out certain situations, certain core decisions, certain moments but also try to and i know it, this is very hard in online environment try to uh, grasp their actual feelings and their actual reactions it is very hard because you won't be for most of the time seeing them and there will be times when they will be divided into their uh, private chat rooms for their squads uh, when you will be jumping around uh, you need to gather uh, as much information of, on, on each and every player as possible because Game Master will not have time for this. He will be uh, constantly occupied with organizing next event uh, or summarizing the previous one. Uh, also, you should be able to help uh, your teams uh, by giving them info on the rules and that's why we 
uh, have uh, here the rules section. I will show you where to look for them and how to use them. Uh, not in much detail, but here is the general idea of the, of the game. Uh, so after the nar narrative briefing is important, uh, but this is on uh, Game Master. Rounds are composed of Game Master uh, narratives, uh, players' actions, and your oversight. Then narrative interlude, is also on Game Master, and you should look for a person that is able to uh, understand the rules, uh, use the tools, online tools, and have this knack for storytelling in those moments. Like this is, uh, uh, these are like the mid expositions. Uh, and here, this narrative interlude is very important because this is the moment when the end game crisis goes into play. What is game end game crisis? I think I will be, I need to say it right now. You and your game master decide up front what the game must achieve. But the end game crisis is this great uh, mace uh, or sword hanged above heads of participants to actually force them on the right narrative trajectory. For example, if they have spread it around too much uh, through the complex and they lose track of each other, then the end game crisis would be that, for example, a large amount of ghouls has uh, risen, like have awakened, and if they stay uh, as a one squad, they will be picked apart, but if they consolidate, they will be uh, able to finish their missions. Or for example, uh, if they uh, are always going as one squad, you tell them that uh, mm, they, there will be a list of endgame crises, but you tell them there is a neurogenic gas which infected uh, them uh, with hallucinations and they do not know each other that well in one squad so they need to be uh, squads apart uh, to finish the missions because if not they see themselves as ghouls and they have friendly fire and there's all kind of mess so end game crisis is something that flips the world uh, upside down something that changes the narrative entirely to push them to that mm, ending experience that we wish to achieve. And narrative finale is basically telling them, uh, summarizing the story, making maybe a cliffhanger for a next meeting or something like that. So the rules, the rules, my favorite, favorite rules, the blood of my veins. Uh, now, wait, 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 wait. Here, in the, this is section six, in the document, this uh, it starts at uh, page 11, and it goes way down here. This is actually still part of the rules. The characters are part of the rules, and we're still going, and we're still going, and it, it doesn't end. Oh, here we are. So 20, uh, blah, uh, 16 pages of rules. I do not expect you to know them by heart, but you should expect your game master to do know them by heart. So you're looking for a person that, as me, is a fanatic of such things and uh, actually uh, finds pleasure in memorizing nooks and crannies of this stuff. But everything I will be talking about is elaborated here. And for example, here, advanced rule, blah, 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 area destroyed. So you know that you don't have to use it. Uh, advanced rules, uh, oh, notes, information, that those are informations that are really important for you to look at. And I suggest uh, for you as a facilitator to definitely look at these notes because that's why, why they are there. Uh, for, why they are there for. I guess that's correct. That's how it should be said. Anyways, uh, and in the this, those rules are basically what your participants received. 
they received this and some narrative briefing. Uh, do not assume they will understand them or even read them because we live in the society of TLDR, too long did it read lol. And uh, that's why in the briefing part, you need to make sure that they understand the rules, at least those that you choose to use. Some of them you may omit. You may, for example, decide that you don't want to use that or other rule. Uh, definitely you may skip all the, the advanced rules because they change dynamics a lot. And I can promise this to you, but you need to make sure that they understand what's going on. Uh, and sorry, questions? Too, but you said just now that um, about uh, materials or rules which your participants will get, and you mean they will get uh, from Game Master, right? No, they need to be, uh, they need to receive those uh, materials up front from yes. a facilitator. Okay, so these are materials which will be available uh, in the folder, but they will also be available to Game Master to look through them. Right. Yes, uh, the, the participants have are uh, are given uh, like this pre-formed uh, briefings for their teams, and they will have it uh, all. You just need to send it to them. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you need to have this in mind that this is important. Uh, if you can tell uh, by now, there's a lot of it here. So uh, now we'll go like in the TLDR fashion, what, if, if, if nothing more, what those participants should understand about the rules. I hope that you will as well. There are four squads. In squads, there are three people. Every squad is different. These are their tokens, their names, and their color. Every <clears throat> squad has their own color. Every squad may do six things. You don't need to know right now what does what, but bear in mind that every action will have a consequence. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I have a problem here. Uh, will have consequence. Uh, and uh, in broad strokes, the hammer you dig for something, you look for something. The, the, the searching, uh, you are carefully looking for something and these are important. Here you try to be sneaky. Here you try to be very, very not sneaky and go balls to the walls. Here you try to get as much resources as you can. And here you try to move around as fast as you can. All that there is to know. Why they are important? Because every of these actions will cost resources and the resources are as follows oxygen ammunition sanity energy and health if they at any point lose uh, the last point of any of these resources and they will be forced to spend another one they will lose one person and when a person dies they are dead but their spirit lives on in their Ariadnas, as they have those neural cortex, <clears throat> that person that died in combat still can communicate with squad uh, because now they are a spirit in the machine. Now, uh, what is there more? They use these actions to secure objectives. They've got every squad has three types of objectives. In your document, gosh, where is it? I have, I have made a mistake. Please, uh, I need to stop sharing for a second. Sorry, because there, there's a problem that I created. Uh, no hurry. You are looking for okay. design doc, as I understand. Yeah. Yes, design. Okay. Yes, I need. Uh, I needed to find it. Uh, so 
as for the squad uh, squad's objectives every uh, squad at the end of the every after every information there are their objectives stated uh, directly and as you can see every squad has uh, three types of objectives gram secured uh, adherence to creed and necessary stratagem uh, without going too deep in this uh, ideas in these ideas <clears throat> ground secured is the easiest to understand go there do that oh now adherence to creed this is role playing stratagem role playing stratagem that tells them how their team with their fluff with their lore supposed to behave in a certain situation this is something for them to play around and necessary stratagem is the most uh, is the hardest because it requires them to keep track of the changing situation and interact with multiple things sometimes simultaneously but they are all described in detail later on and if they are able to get uh, they do not know what are their uh, objectives they are just informed that if a squad does his or hers national come on does the objective they receive this token uh, objective secured mm -hmm. now they will be moving through zones can i interrupt zones you? will have colors sorry yes of course previous slide please mm -hmm. no or this one yes so all these this objectives one. the squads will get in the uh, leaflet like all the yes, the squads receive their objectives in their leaflet. I would like to they are... because there is a question uh, when we were when you were showing on game design doc that there are sixteen pages of rules. There is a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so the players should they read all the sixteen pages of rules before? They don't receive uh, sixteen pages. This uh, it's about eight pages. And part of these are the narrative introductions to their teams. So uh, they do not receive everything. It's not like they need to know it all, but I give them the ability to uh, <clears throat> know the rules because I did it. Uh, I was, while I was creating the game, I experimented with different approaches. And I found that many players actually want to have as many rules up front as possible uh, as possible and th they have this gamer mindset where they try to find a way to exploit the rules for their uh, for their advantage okay uh, but just to put it in order i would like just to like remind that game design doc is for you as facilitator mm -hmm. and for game masters it's not for your participants yes and you will have additional materials uh, we will share it with you soon uh, and Part of these materials which are going to be handed over to your participants could partly be translated into national languages okay and there is the other question so players receive a eight pages rule summary and that pamphlet pamphlet pamphlet, pamphlet <laughs> with their team objectives or does yep. the pamphlet has the eight eight pages rules included so uh, it, it is all around all, all together in one packet Pamphlet uh, also so each, has the, so the rules. Each team receives a pamphlet with their own uh, specific things for their team, correct? Yes, every team has their own pamphlet. And the general rules uh, that the players will know? Uh, they are in the pamphlet because the, the, the general rules are given to each team specifically. Uh, it's, it's like they have a core part which is the same and yeah. additional specific elements parts. for them they, specifically. And important questions, do they receive it from us? Yes, you as organizer are prepared, like you are hiring Game Master and then you are preparing all these materials and you will have to know what is there to send to participants. But it's easy and it will be really explained by Martin uh, in the end, right? Yep, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let us carry on. Uh, so these are the zones. As you can see, the zones are have colors. The colors are information for Game Master. Where are they? 
plus this is an information for participants. Where are they? Because they coordinate now, let's go to the blue zone or something. Every zone has a different name and stuff. It's irrelevant at this point, but these zones, as you can see, uh, have uh, danger tokens. And danger tokens, this is th those are challenges. Uh, each challenge costs resources. And uh, if they, participants will receive a written description of the area. Of course, Game Master can add something to this written description, but at the same moment, all the squads will receive the written description. And based upon this description, they need to guess what challenge awaits there inside and choose a specific action accordingly. Because from those six actions, only one fits one of these five challenges and they need to guess it correctly. If they guess it correctly, they lose not much resource, many resources. If they guess it incorrectly, they lose a lot of resources. If they guess incorrectly three times, they are basically dead. So they, because, well, no, uh, technically they have, they can, they can, uh, do it five times. They can guess incorrectly twice and then they lose their first member. And after a fifth wrong shot, they, uh, the entire squad is eliminated, at which point the game ends. Because losing of a squad is a dramatic failure for the entire game. You go to the debriefing sections immediately. Uh, it is stated in the design doc. So this is the overall... Uh, flow of the round because as you remember uh, the game consists of 10 rounds and every round consists of uh, squads actually uh, speaking well participants within the squad speak among them what they want to do which uh, decisions with actions they take then they discuss it with uh, their leader discuss it with other teams. Then they can barter, uh, negotiate between them uh, upon the final effect. Then game master tells them where they right or wrong. Then they lose or gain resources accordingly. Then uh, they receive narrative options like the events that they choose uh, Usually it's a choice between A, B, or C. In this room, you can do A, B, C, and they must choose one of them. They decide upon them. The game master resolves decisions and it starts all over again. This is uh, about 20 minutes, about 15, 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. So consider this. But uh, uh, sometimes people want to have more of it, like to make it 40 minutes even. That's bulky. But I, I would uh, not recommend allowing it to last more than 25 minutes. And that were, that were the rules. Everything is deeply, uh, is written down in depth in your design doc. Are there any questions until this point? Because I'm going to the next, next section. So there is a comment. Actually, you could go and look for this comment on chat now, Martin. Yes. This is general comment F of Andia. I think it would be helpful to understand what info duties are in Game Master's control and what in facilitators have to do. Because now it is crammed all together, but it needs to be clear. For I will then... Uh, okay, uh, wait, because I have... I have to go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I have lost myself. Uh, okay. Well, just in the very beginning. Thank you. Uh, you are asking me what informational uh, responsibilities or generally what responsibilities are there because I unfortunately cannot find this uh, comment. 
Oh wait, uh, maybe. Oh yes, I have it. So uh, maybe, maybe you can tell what me. What info the, duties yes. are in game master's control, and what are facilitators in in, con in control? I understand. Okay, I understand. This uh, basically, I believe that only the briefing part. Oh, briefing, going over the starter pack. Four, uh, there are four starter packs, one for each team. And basically you, you as a facilitator must provide them with those information. You yourself should understand it to be able to uh, explain them problems potential or misconceptions or just overall help. So a starter, it would be uh, recommended to get used to entire design document, but uh, baseline motive is that you yourself understand the starter pack at least as correctly as your game master and are able to inform your participants about that. So those are the informational uh, responsibilities uh, as for this particular uh, game, because that's what I uh, think you uh, meant. And the game master, uh, he is responsible basically for everything else as for the informing, because everything, uh, for example, Game Master is the person that gives the narrative descriptions of the rooms to the, to the players, to the participants. You don't interact with this in any way. He is the one that knows what is in each zone and what are the challenges. You don't have to know it. Oh, uh, we also go now to the briefing part, which is also very important for you as facilitators, right? Yes. So uh, please move first, I will just one thing: the preparations. Mm -hmm. uh, this is how I envision preparing the game. Coordinating this is on you. I. That's how I would do it. Discuss the vision with your game masters, and here you have. Uh, months prior. You sit down, you talk to each other, you try to get a common ground. How, what story do you wish to tell? Then you organize a short half an hour, an hour, what else, meeting with your participants. This will show you two things. First, are they into this so that they come? Are they involved enough to be there on time? Because if you have fluctuating amount of participants that just won't do it in this kind of game, you need three people on the team and you need four teams. That's that. So you try to make them uh, as dedicated as possible. And here you can create a hype. So during this meeting, you can give them starter pack or you can just uh, talk about the game. Game master can tell them a bit of a story. Like this is this is a, a moment that you try to get a grip. What can you expect from the players during the game? And this is done two weeks prior. Then you divide participants into squads and send them appropriate uh, copy of uh, squad starter pack. And as I said, it's preferred to preferably you do this right after the meeting. Uh, and then you meet with participants before the game to take care of all the possible technical issues. And one hour before the game, this is the moment when they will be late. They will certainly be late. They will have problems with getting to this or that platform. They will have questions about starter pack. And if they don't, you need to find out that they do have a questions and make them understand that they do have a questions. And uh, after that, Game Master takes, takes them away from you for four hours. And you turn, get back at the debriefing. But preferably, you're there all the time to help with things if things require your actions. Okay. So that's, 
how I see it. Hmm? Is it uh, like, did you finish to answer the yes. question? Okay, then because there are other ones. First, a short uh, answer, please. Is the three persons per team a maximum required number or minimum? It's the required number. The required number. It's a number that they should there should be. <laughs> so uh, it's not like there's a wiggle room. You can potentially uh, play with two people on team, but then it uh, makes... Uh, basically all the mechanics of negotiation obsolete okay so, but four is possible mm, i wouldn't recommend but yes but it's get clustered and when you uh, go over three people uh, then uh, what happens is that most of the time uh, people are there always is a person in one team or another that feels excluded that feels that they don't have anything to do, don't have anything to say because all the decisions are made over their heads. So three people, because they have their own voting system inside, so and three people makes it balanced. Four okay. people. Okay. okay, recommended. Okay, and there is another question, Nuno. I'm not sure if I will follow. Maybe you could ask it. Uh, yeah. Uh, or link the player uh, squad elimination. Uh, so uh, Martin was uh, previously talking about the, the squad being eliminated when they make five mistakes or something like that. Yes. And uh, uh, because I, I play board games and role plays, player elimination is always a very sensitive subject, especially here because uh, it, uh, the players are separated in different squads, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you said that if one squad screws up, kind of, like the five, mm -hmm. five fails, then the game is over for every squad. And yes. I, I'm concerned about that because first, uh, for my read from the document, this is kind of um, uh, intended to be like a mini series. So play, it's, it's, it's you can play in it on a one shot, but uh, it's preferable or recommended to try to do it in a mini campaign, like uh, a few sessions, yes. right? So what happens if uh, one group screws up on the second session? Is do we have to start? Everyone starts all over? No, That's no, no. What, I will tell you how uh, what I did. Uh, because I've been uh, messing around with this idea several times and it is, uh, this game is about cooperation, even if they don't see it as such. Yeah. Game master has a lot of things that he can do to save the squad. For example, squads can exchange resources to stay alive. That's one thing. Second thing, uh, in-game occurrences, uh, if they make if they screwed up their guessing game, but they make a great decision narratively, they are rewarded with resources that can save their lives. This is the second thing. Third thing, if they die uh, narratively, it can be spinned around as something glorious or heroic. And I have found that several times, teams, squads decided that they stay as, uh, as a living wall for the rest to evacuate. And on the next uh, episode of the series, participants that have sacrificed their squads, their squad, were given a new squad and they were going inside again. And there were, for example, they had additional mission to reclaim dog tags from the lost squad because there were their friends and we made an entire story around that sacrifice. The game uh, is, those objectives are there to trick people into thinking competitively. But this game is all about the story like in the TV series. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm just cutting you with answers. There is another question about the narration, but I would like you to answer it quickly and go to the briefing part, which is very crucial. Uh, so the question is, do players see on the game map what challenge there is in a room before deciding to move there? No, they need to guess. They receive the information what the challenge is only after they have committed. Okay, please go to the briefing part and Diet. all your dear participants of this Zoom call. 
for all your information. I believe that we will be a little bit late than till five today because we have nine minutes to five uh, and we have still a little of organizational information in the end and survey. So uh, let's do it like this, that of course, if you are not capable of staying with us longer than after five, there will be recording of, of this uh, and you will also get a follow-up email. But if you are able to stay, please do. <laughs> Martin, follow, follow okay. up. So the, the briefing, the briefing will have, as you can see, four stages. The first one is hype. And I have provided you with uh, questions that are very important to be asked. I know that they sound lame, but it's just a message, not how you would uh, ask them. Yes. So uh, you rephrase them uh, considering the uh, mindset of your players. Uh, I wouldn't call them, what moved you during the game? Uh, I would rather ask them, what made you have a blast? What was the best part, mates? Or something like that. Or I would, in Polish, jak tam byszki było fajnie. Anyways, uh, that's, that's the gist of it. Uh, but the most important thing about hype is that they, after the game, can express themselves. Like, uh, they can instantly throw out every uh, their, their their emotions their concepts and if you see that they are hyped and they cannot stop flapping about what happened you've done a great job the game succeeded they had fun objective secured if not then something went wrong and it must be rectified later on and that's when you go to the second part the feedback uh, they need to vocalize their opinions and you need to draw out of them the informations, what they think about the rules, because it is very easy to blame everything that goes wrong on the rules, on the not understanding of the rules or that the rule sucks or something is OP, uh, overpowered, I mean, uh, or things like that. You need to sort the rules first before you go into the meaning, but because if you don't do it, then people will... Uh, have mixed feelings and you just say, okay, the rules are the rules, but and you uh, now go to the inception, your decision. Look, you made this decision why? Because you thought that the rule will give you this and that. For example, you went there because you were certain that you will win. You anticipated success. You blame the rules right now because your anticipation was bad, not the rules. But if the rules are bad, previous moment is the moment when you sort it out. You get my drift? You need to be able to uh, touch their hearts here, like point fingers here, positively and negatively. It is, of course, preferable to be able to... Uh, not do it personal to a person, that's why they are in the squads. You say that, Tata, you were like warmongering bar barbarians. You, you understand. You, you just uh, killed their, them all. Your decision, your recklessness. For example, if you need to say something unpleasant, but you don't have to call names or point fingers, it is up to you how you uh, consider uh, conducting this particular part, but those two questions are necessary. If you feel that you don't want to pull them uh, by the beard uh, and like speak about their wrongdoings and you don't want to uh, tell them, cool, people, you're good, you don't want any of this, you can go straight to the point and ask, but in real life, in your real situation, how do you think, what would you feel? What would make it, what would this all uh, create in you? You try to make them think, even if only for a second, what would be their experience of the situation that they were viewing through the eyes of their characters 
And this is where sometimes awesome things happen. Sometimes, most of the times. Mm. Adolescents love to be asked about their feelings. They love to be asked about their imagination. And you now go to the discussion. And in this discussion, you take a step back and you allow them to, because they should be at this point throwing uh, things at themselves, you just moderate the discussion, trying to take, uh, make the moral of the story, the point of the story, emerge from their discussion. I am unable, unfortunately, to train you here how to uh, moderate the discussion in this situ in this way. But uh, if uh, this is something that can be learned, that can be uh, found, because it's a common technique, it's not something that I have made up, and it's technically not a part of the game, but it's important. So that's the debriefing and roll credits. We that so Kanya, are there any questions? Somebody. Yes, so uh, my proposal, thank you very much, Martin, for this enormous uh, work you did to show us what we actually should understand and how to, you know, understand the game before actually letting people play it and letting Game Master to, to organize it in details. Um, I hope you, you really... Uh, got a lot out of it, but of course there should be questions and answers session. It's five o'clock now, so majority or maybe many people of us need to leave now. But still, I would like to use this time for those who for those who want to leave immediately. Just please put your question on chat, and for those who are able to sit with us for I don't know twenty more minutes, please. Please ask this question uh, through Zoom directly. So, I stop sharing. So if you are leaving, um, it I, doesn't look like anybody's left. We will be sending uh, a survey to understand what you might need in addition to this training. If anything was missed, what worked well. Um, and there's a little bit of a like a knowledge test in their quiz. So for any of anybody that was present on Friday's training, we plan on using this as a way to understand what you understood. And don't worry if you understand everything, and it's very clear. Again, we're still asking for that information. If there's, there's something that's very clear, important, can I please let us know? Yeah. Uh, one thing about the test: uh, the test is about not if you did right; it's about if I did right. If I convey messages correctly, you will be able to answer the questions. Uh, so th that's knowledge test, uh, which tests me actually. So don't be afraid of it uh, in any uh, any uh, amount, in any extent. Sorry, Aaron, please continue. No, 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 no worries. I, I didn't want to so uh, put it on you. <laughs> should I read it loud or you want to read it from Zoom? Read it loud. It's, it's like an interview. Okay. Uh, po, 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 po. So where where the presentation could be found, this is an organizational question, and you will get email with all the information and link to folder. Uh, preferably tomorrow. I'm not sure if morning, but at noon it should be at your inbox. Okay. Um, there was a question. Uh, po, 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 po. When will be the video of game for game master available? Martin? I will tell you in a second. I need to check the schedule. Please, yeah. please bear right. with me. Bear with me. This will take only a second more. Uh, video of the game, of the Game Masters. I think the first, yes, yes. In the a week. First, uh, yeah, in a week. Yeah. First so, or the second, something like this. In a, in a week time. Right, and there there's be. also a question of Seval, which I prefer Seval, you come out and ask directly because it was very far away. Hello, hello. I asked hello. that what experience do you recommend, uh, uh, exercise do you recommend for the players that didn't play RPG game before? Uh, okay, so this is really, that's why I have not post 
there any particular experience uh, exercise because it really depends on the chemistry between you and your participants uh, in their backgrounds uh, because whatever i say right now may sound stiff uh, in one situation and fitting in the other situation uh, my uh, like my role playing experience that i uh, often times do with participants is that I make them tell a story. They, every person must say a sentence. And they, I set like the, the um, high, uh, order in which they must say something. And we, uh, for example, I start and once, uh, that's, that sucks. Imagine a grand tower of white marble. And then another person in this tower, there is something. And the next person, and that something is something. And they speak collectively by, by going around the circle. They, we create a story. First time, the story sucks completely. It's, it's incoherent, has nothing, mm, nothing sensible going for it. But then we do it again. Uh, now that they are opened up a little bit, they have did it once, it sucked, they know what to do next time. We do it again. And the second time I give them uh, music. So I mm, set the music, uh, which should evoke emotions. And they uh, set their tone of the story to the tone of the music. And the stories are generally at the second time way better. And they it makes them like warmed up a little bit. So that's that's what I usually do with kids. Thank I hope you. I have answered your... Uh... <laughs> yeah, it was quite good. Huh? And I saw, like, sorry, I saw there was a question from Kingsley that can we create a short video to explain the settings to the players? Yeah, like the rules. Yeah, it can be more effective for me because like reading a document is like kind of a bit boring and you're missing some stuff and video can be more. Effective. I will tell you uh, that uh, when I was preparing my kids uh, for the game, uh, I uh, video conference them on Messenger uh, dressed up as Dr. Major Goran. And I was oh. telling them about the store, the game as one of the characters, because uh, in the movies, uh, I play uh, Dr. Major Goran. So one of those rules. So uh, it, it, you can create your own character. It is advised that uh, your uh, GM has, uh, Game Master has their own character. For example, a person that is uh, coordinating their actions and uh, he or she has the headphones and or rebreather or something like that. You, you know, you can create hype and you can create story way before the game even starts. It, mm -hmm. it works wonders. So there. And... Martin, you had a f quite a few questions because um, it seems like quite a lot of people here have experience. So I believe the, the program Astral was recommended. Um, so I'm not sure if if that's an option. So apparently this is an alternative to Roll20. So anybody, whoever that asked that question, I'm not familiar with that platform. So maybe if, if you don't mind following up uh, with that question. Uh, okay, so as for that, uh, unfortunately, I am I know only Roll Twenty, but uh, you will be uh, granted access to all the graphical materials, so you can set up your own game in whatever you wish. If you wish, you can even create a normal board game out of it. Uh, you can print it all, put it on the table, and just go with it. Uh, I did it once, and it's. Uh, for me, it's even better, but it's because I love uh, personal contact with people. That's why I'm so sad during the quarantine. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you can do whatever you wish. Uh, but unfortunately, I do not know Astral. And please, people, this, this is uh, like for you to have fun with. Uh, I believe it's in the beginning of most of the RPG uh, um, source books, rule books. Uh, if there is a rule that you don't like, just leave it out. If there's a rule you wish to in include, just put it there. That's that's what the games are for. 
Mm. I, I also wanted to ask you something like video material related. Would it be possible that we we like make a small teaser for like getting attention and getting you know players on board? Well, uh, I, if you ask me to do it, I cannot help you because no, I'm. No, I mean, I, I would do it. Just it's it's not. I mean, if I'm using you know like also, it's a question to uh, TechSoup that if yeah, I mean, if I create a video, of course that would be also I think your IP, but I guess we can use it. What, what I, is I think the for, there? for us, uh, we don't mind what you create, uh, what you need to use to recruit. Just if um, d don't use uh, the Game Changer logo unless you're consulting with us first or TechSoup logos or anything like that. So we encourage everybody to use their own materials to recruit. Um, our project partners did the same. Uh, it's just for us, we just need you to consult us if you're using our logo. But if you're creating something outside of this, by all means, go for it. So uh, however you all need to recruit, we just want you all to succeed in, in your recruitment process and making sure that you have the right target audience, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so by all means. Okay, thanks. And um, uh, regarding the, the platform, uh, I have in mind one is called the Town, and it's a different platform because you have your own avatar that is moving in the space. It's a virtual space platform and using a, a proximity chat. So it's like uh, if you are close to someone, you can talk to him and see him in the video. But if you are far from him, you cannot talk or uh, or see him. So I think, and also you can create rooms, and it's like you are moving, like uh, in a Pokemon, for example, you are moving and you reach this room, and uh, you can enter in another space, and this space is as own virtual uh, uh, lens and height. And I think it could be very nice to even implement after the fall in uh, in uh, this platform. It sounds absolutely awesome. Uh, uh, I am. I, uh, could you uh, type in the chat how it's called? What? What? Yeah. What? What? Because it's I'm similar interested. to wonder. Yeah. yeah. Voila, done. Gather yeah, town. Okay. I need to Google it up for myself and my homies. Okay. Are there? Yeah, and I think. more. I, I think something else that's very relevant. So. Um, any of you that are planning on using a different platform um, outside of Roll20, if there's any way, uh, this is not a requirement by any mean, and means, and by all means, I, I imagine that many of the games will be conducted in different languages. But if you could record that, that would be really helpful. So that way, for example, we can show Marcin how it works because as Marcin mentioned, he created the game around Roll20, but I don't think Marcin is opposed to if another platform is discovered by one of you all. Uh, I don't think there's an I'm issue even, with us. Record. Yeah. I'm even for it, for it because I'm yeah. not a great fan of Roll20. It was just a means to an end. Sorry, have I, I have interrupted you again. No, 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 no. no. I, I said my piece. So <laughs> thank, thank you for okay. opening it up. Um, Any question? If I may. Uh, thank you. Uh, so it is regarding um, a subject uh, because uh, the game talks about themes of uh, post-apocalyptic and horror and stuff like that. And um, will a future version of uh, After the Fall include uh, safety tools or at least uh, uh, mention uh, where uh, game masters and facilitators can find them? Because the game can lead to certain topics. Mm -hmm. which can be hard for some participants, um, mainly if we are talking about uh, adults, adolescent and uh, teens, right? Okay, as for the safety tools, this book here was written by the Polish Association of uh, RPGs, Life R uh, Action R RPGs, and it is mostly about safety tools. So that's what is my source. I, I unfortunately don't know of any source like uh, sensible, reliable source in the internet. Bec but your uh, concern is uh, absolutely on point. I did not put any effort uh, neither in the design document nor here in the training to elaborate on this uh, subject because, uh, well, I just uh, consider it uh, implicitly uh, in the the briefing skills, yes. So, but uh, I, I, uh, okay. 
maybe I, I suppose there are there should be groups like in, in Poland. I, I, I know that on Polish Facebooks there are groups that speak about this, but I don't know of any like concrete source uh, about debriefing safety tools and game safety tools. So I'm sorry, I cannot help more. Okay, no problem. Would it, uh, would it be, um, first of all, I mean, I'm just wondering because it would be definitely great to to get each other's contacts and maybe set up some kind of forum where we can discuss 